y hago un poco de explicación de Dios parece. Y si realmente es insostenible en inglés, pues lo. Uh, me dice, no, aquí ya está ya. Bueno, ok, so. So now I will go to the next You're going to introduce me. Yes. It's for me an authentic pleasure to be able to have you with us here at the Daily Fit. He is a catedratic of the Institute of Cybernetics at the University of Utah. He is a collaborator with our group in various projects. And he is a person who can give us some visions diferentes y muy interesantes de lo que es el mundo de la investigación interdisciplinar y de tecnología de comunicación. Eh, como os comentaba al principio de, de esta sesión, contamos con él además, que es el profesor de claustro de, de doctores, que es también el profesor invitado de la Universidad de Salamanca. Aprovechamos unas ayudas que, que sacaron con los nuevos doctorados, entonces de las 3-4 que nos pudieron una poder para Lili, lleva con nosotros trabajando desde los pues, empleados del mes de noviembre, en medio de octubre, pasa tiempo sí. muy rápido, y de alguna manera lo queremos engañarlo para que se vea aquí como en su casa, y que sí, sí. venga a las redes como quiera, sí. y entremos. Ven, es por mí a preso, tu experiencia. Gracias. Gracias very much. Uh, it's also a great honor for me to be here and to present to you, especially to the students. I have the impression we have uh, teachers and students. <laughs> I will speak to, speak to the back, especially. Um, I was thinking, I wrote my presentation, and it was about 50 slides, slides long and lasted two hours. Everything I think about methodology. So I didn't do that. You will be pleased to hear that. Uh, Fran or somebody, could somebody sit here and uh, yes. just press the button? Um, so I'm from the humanities. My degree was in history of art and English literature. And here I am, 30 years later, I'm working in, in the, the department which is mainly technological. My career for the last uh, 15 years has been around technology. So I've made quite a journey in my understanding of what my academic work is. I've also worked in uh, training in industry and personal relations, and I've worked as an art history teacher, and as a teacher in, in primary schools. So I have many different uh, aspects. So I thought I would give you a talk about the different methodological issues which for me have been important in my, in, this, in my career. So it's not a history of methodology. It doesn't include everything. And somebody will probably be offended. Somebody will probably say, ah, no, at some point. I'm sorry. I, uh, I do not intend to upset anybody, to make anybody unhappy. OK. Uh, next. Oh, I, oh, thank you. <laughs> okay. How are you? How am I doing? I, I can see I've lost some people already. Um, okay. So the arts are about personal experience, technically. How do I feel? What do I see? But as uh, not even the technologist, then just as a student, I wanted to know something about the world outside as well as the arts. So I had a problem. How do, how do I understand that? So I remember reading as a student about this. And of course, you come across the empirical methods, scientific methods. Here is what the dictionary of Merriam-Webster says. Originating, originating in or based on observation or experience, capable of being verified or disproved. Okay, very good. That's easy. But I wanted to avoid what we call in English naive realism. That is to say, the world is here, I look at it, that's it, no problem. 
I think there is a problem from the arts. There is a big problem. It's the subjective reality of what we experience. Mm -hmm. So do you know who this man is? I don't, it's not a test. I'm just <laughs> wondering if you know. Um, if you know I am from the UK, and you know I am talking about empiricism, you might guess this is David Hume. If you don't know who David Hume is, I suggest you go and find out who David Hume is. <laughs> because one of the things I am telling you in my presentation is, you will see on my last slide, do not think that methodology is a recipe only. It is a philosophy and an understanding. And if you do not understand the foundations of the ideas, it is difficult to understand <coughs> what you do. So I do suggest you look at people like this. There are many, Locke and many others, but to engage. OK, David Hume, 1748. What is the nature of all our reasonings concerning the matter of fact, he asks? Answer, the relation of cause and effect. Good. What is the foundation of all our reasonings and conclusions concerning that relation? Experience. Yeah. Okay. What is the foundation of all conclusions from experience? Ah. Priority in time, proximity in space, and the necessary connection. So now, this is more subtle. How does the necessary connection arise from a number of similar instances which occur in the constant conjunction of these events? Okay. Now, this is very interesting. It's very interesting because this is the foundation of the empirical method, but that according to, to Hume, we have no access to physical reality. We only have events which we observe and which we connect to make an ascription of causality. Do you understand what I'm saying? <coughs> now, this, when I read this as a young man, I thought, wow, I thought that methodology, empirical methodology, was about facts, not about constructing a world, but to Hume, it is about constructing a world from repeated events. So this, I suggest you remember when we are talking from here on. Empiricist methodologies over the last 200 years have triumphed. They are completely. We observe regularities conceived in different ways. And in the data, according to empiricism, are facts linked, sorry, interlinked, it should say, interlinked facts about from the world. This is this sentence is incorrect. If you don't understand it, it's because it, <laughs> it's incorrect. From the data, from the, the, the connections of, of events in time, emerge the facts which are in the data. And its success is demonstrated by manipulating the world. These wonderful things. I like this very much. Portable steam engine. It's a, 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 an old way of thinking about portable, I think. <laughs> but you know, we have technology making things happen. We have chemical methods, scientific, physical methods, and we have practical things like the atomic bomb. I mean, you can't argue with the atomic bomb. It worked, you know. So some respect for empirical methodology is required by the atomic bomb. But there are social and political questions. In empiricism, sorry about my English, empiricism and uh, its close cousin, positivism, this is because I was 
writing my slides this morning. Uh, there is no room for social or political understanding. We go from the facts, the sequences of events, to the knowledge. <coughs> if you don't know Kuhn, you should be aware of Kuhn, a very, very important <coughs> writer who described how the paradigms of science change. Well, according to empirical methodology, this is not explicable because you go from the data to the insight. So why would scientific paradigms suddenly change? You expect science to progress slowly, gradually, but it doesn't. Suddenly, beep, new, new information arrives. How? Not new information, new paradigm arrives. How, he asks, through the operation of social processes. So this, is a, this for me, was a serious um, question mark over how I should understand the obvious success of empirical methodology. So there are re relative uh, critiques from a more or less Marxist perspective. <laughs> Stephen Jay Gould, the mismeasurement of man, mis sorry, mismeasure, it's not mismeasurement, mismeasure. The mismeasure of man. Stephen Jay Gould is a hero of mine. I think he's a wonderful writer. I encourage you to write and read him. He's excellent on statistics, and I think everybody who studies education should read this. It's about the, the, the validity of IQ testing. So uh, in the States, he's dead now. They thought he was uh, some kind of a radical revolutionary communist. In fact, he was a kind of social democrat. Uh, but you know how this is. And uh, Rose is a writer in the, Stephen Rose is a writer in, in the UK who's written a lot about these, these matters. But this is a recent book by him, which I enjoy. So, if you want, if you're interested in how society influences what is understood to be fact, these are good places. And then, so that's one thing, Kuhn and social influence on methodology. This is another big question mark for me personally over empirical methodology. Russell, Bertrand Russell, amazing uh, academic from the UK early in the 20th century and uh, lived through till I was a young man. When I was a young man, he was the leader of the anti-nuclear movement. But in the early 20th century, he wrote Principia Mathematica. Okay, Principia Mathematica wanted to show that all of mathematics was logical. That any statement within mathematics should be true and verifiable. If it was not true and verifiable, there was something wrong with the mathematics. This was his program. He had trouble with paradox. He talked about the paradox. <coughs> the barber shaves everyone in the village who does not shave themselves. You understand? No. Does the barber shave himself? Because if he shaves himself, then he does not shave himself. But if he, does, if he doesn't shave himself, he should shave himself. So this is a typical paradox. Russell's answer is, it's nonsense. It's stupid. I will not pay any attention to this because the idea of a set which contains itself is meaningless. Eso se entiende. Un conjunto que se contiene en el mismo es, no tiene sentido. Es this answer. Okay. Do you know what the picture is? Escher. Escher. <coughs> but Gödel, I told, I said I would introduce mathematics into my, into my uh, presentation. Gödel, remember the name, okay? I think that. Gödel showed 
that any self-consistent, recursive, axiomatic system, as I see, system of mathematics, mathematics that describes the functionality of the same system, which is powerful enough to describe the arithmetic of natural numbers, can further describe two and two equals four, will be. Oh, and there are true. Then there are true propositions about the naturals that cannot be proved from the axioms. So he demonstrated that Russell's project to show that it was possible to have a complete logical description of the world was impossible. As an amazing, this is extraordinary. Because we think that an empirical methodology should make a complete and logical description of the world, but Gödel shows this is not true. Um, so this this had a big effect on me personally. There's a beautiful book by Doug Hochstatter called Gödel, Escher, and Bach, which I have not included there. It's a beautiful, easy, but well, not easy, popular book, not a, and which made me understand good. Okay, recursion, which is what Gödel is talking about, systems which refer to themselves, is a deep, deep problem. Hume says in his book in the 18th century, the mind never has anything present to it but the perceptions and cannot possibly reach any experience of their connection with objects. This is very clear at the beginning of empiricism. Now, if that is true, how do I explain the atom bomb? If it's all relative, why, can, why do we have technology? Well, I think because as humans, we have the same Equipment, hands, eyes, tongue, nose, we experience the world in a very similar way. If you do not believe, get out of my mind's machinado. If you don't believe this, then we experience the world in similar ways. So our our perceptions are more or less reliable. As social beings, we have very different perceptions of the world. So our this problem of Hume becomes a big problem in the social sciences. When we study ourselves, we don't always have agreement. Now, cybernetics. I had to put a slide about cybernetics. I am the uh, the um, professor of educational cybernetics. Now I could have given you a lecture about any one of these bullet points for today because this is very interesting to me. But I think more general, perhaps, is better for you. But cybernetics is a whole tradition of understanding recursive logic and modeling, ways of conceptualizing information. Shannon, Claude Shannon. If you have any engineers in here, you will know Shannon. But um, McCulloch, um, modeling and conceptualizing self-reference. The Chilenos will know Maturana. Maybe others will know Maturana. Good, yes, good. It's, uh, I'm big, um, very. And Luhmann, Luhmann, who is the um, who applies Maturana to sociology. Very interesting about messaging. And communications, and uh, um, there is a, in, in this wide interdisciplinary field, there's a focus on uh, the performative, that's trying things out. I'm sorry that our robotics friend is not here because this is very related to robotics. Um, try things out and it's try to explain what happens. It's very without the formal uh, hypothesizing of, of Popper. Now, I find this interdisciplinary tradition 
very helpful in understanding empiricism in the context of lived experience. So if you are curious about this, I recommend this, this literature. And I'm happy to exchange emails with you about any, any aspect of these people. Because that's my enthusiasm. <coughs> I was also drawn to other alternatives to empiricism. There's, these are three of the big ones you will hear. <laughs> I'm sorry to lo siento, but si 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 Husserl, this is way back in the early 20th, early 20th century, this has as its con exclusive concern experiences intuitively seizable and analyzable in the pure generality of their essence. Um, now, you can see he is taking the road of saying, of concentrating on Hume's difficulty with the, uh, our knowledge of the world. And he's saying, we only have our experience. And what we need to do as researchers is try to find and describe the essential aspects of, of this experience. And if we can share that and represent it, that's our research outcome. And I've been involved in that. And very interesting things can come out. And then grounded theory is, more, is a more empirical uh, way, but it's kind of it's the typical uh, studies where you take interviews or documents and you code them with NVIDIA and, and these systems. But you try, the product is a theoretical structure rather than a theoretical structure being applied to the data. So that's interesting too. You can see how this could be useful. And action research where you're saying, no, we, it's too difficult to make something generalizable. We will work on a specific problem with the people who are involved in the problem. We will, uh, the outcome of our research will be a change, and we will document how we achieved it. Good. These are all valid, useful responses to the problem of recursion. How do we study ourselves with an empirical method? But none of these three gives you an answer to how do I accumulate my results. So I went to do some grounded theory in this school, and my friend went to do some grounded theory in this school, and we have two results. How do we relate them? How do we? Then next year, do another set of grounded theory which builds on this set of grounded theory. It's very hard with any of these methods to convincingly create accumulation. So maybe the empirical approach is the one we should take, even though it has all these problems of paradox and social influence. And the empirical strikes back. This is for the people in the back row. Okay. Uh, so this is a quote from the uh, from the uh, from the U.S. Department of Education. Project requirements in 2003. And this is worth reading. To determine whether the project produces meaningful effects on student achievement or teacher performance. Evaluation methods using an experimental design are best for determining project effectiveness. Thus, the project should use an experimental design under which participants, e.g. students, are randomly assigned to participate in project activities being evaluated or to a control group that does not participate in the project activities. Okay, so they, this is 2003. This is the United States government saying None of this grounded theory, none of this acti uh, action research, none of this phenomenology, no thank you. We want pharmacology in the classroom. We want the methods of hard science of physics, and we want them in the classroom. 
Well, this is very interesting. What do we make of this? The question is, how does it, there's a, this is related to some, a number of social developments, political. Evidence-based policy. In the UK, this is very important. In Spain, do you have this evidence-based policy? Where the, the minister says, my policy is correct because, look, my scientists tell me it is correct. So, we are changing the curriculum. This is very typical in the UK and in the States. Um, which is fine, but the question is, do the scientists always give you the right answers? It's very helpful for the ministers. Yes. Now, Seddon, is very, who, who is from the cybernetics tradition, has written a very easy, accessible book about this. I would strongly recommend it if you are interested in the use of measurable outcomes to guide policy. Big money is at stake here. <laughs> is an education like the climate and tobacco? I mean, these are just two random examples. So I'm not making, uh, not making a big point about these, but you can see. McGraw-Hill's website yesterday, uh, uh, using LearnSmart to study has been proven to lead to improved learning efficiency. So buy it. Pearson, more than six million students around the world are now using Pearson, MyLab, and mastering products. Integrated usage of these products has been shown to provide measurable gains in student retention, subsequent success, and overall achievement. Six million who pay each 20 pounds, 20 euros? I don't know. 600, this is a lot of money. So if I go to Pearson and say, I don't agree with your methodology, and I don't agree with your conclusions, will they be happy? No. <laughs> and it's very valuable to Pearson to demonstrate to the government of the United States and the UK that their results are the correct ones. So, this, I would suggest, needs to be related to this. I'm not saying they are evil, they are not necessarily the evil empire, but we should remember the social context in which this is happening before we simply accept the results of this methodology. Okay, now, how am I doing for time? Are you all right? You okay? Uh, Gregory Bateson is a big hero of mine. I edited the proceedings, the proceedings of a conference about him this year. Uh, he was in the cybernetics tradition. He's a very funny writer, as well as a brilliant, uh, a very brilliant thinker. This is from one of his books. A common form of empty, empty explanation is the appeal to what I have called dormitive principles. <laughs> Borrowing the word dormitive from Molière. You can see I like, I have a literature background here, I like this. There is a coda in dog Latin to Molière's La Malade Imaginaire, and in this coda, okay, in this work by Molière, we see on the stage a medieval oral doctoral examination, very like the examination you will have in three years. <laughs> the examiners ask the candidate, why does opium put people to sleep? The answer is because opium contains a dormitive principle. Ah, say the doctors. Bene, bene, bene. Very good. So you can see what I am saying here. We restate the problem with different terminology. Identifying some quality to which we ascribe the thing we are trying to explain. And then we are finished. There are many theses 
in the library which use this methodology. But I think you should not be happy with it. <laughs> okay. So, the normative principle in the classroom. First, mea culpa. I am not just pointing the finger at everybody else. So, where is the pedagogic goodness of a good lesson located in a lesson? Where is it? If we can find it, we can share it. I looked for the teacher's activity and tried to capture that with IMS learning design. It's a way of describing teaching activities. Others look for it in the content or in the curriculum. That's where the goodness is. We can test for the goodness. Well, this class which uses this content has good results. This class which does not use this content has bad results. So the goodness is in here. We have tested it. We assess it. We publish it. And average it across. We say, ah, but the results are not exactly the same. So we take an average for Madrid. Uh, and this is the goodness quality of this content. Oh, but in Barcelona it's not exactly the same. Oh, well, we do some more averaging. So the goodness and quality of this content is now 5.3. Good. Oh, but in England it's, it's all the same. More research is necessary. Okay. Now, I have been involved in projects like this, so I am not saying everybody else is bad. But more generally, why does that child learn more than the other? Because learned doctors, they contain more or less capacity to learn. Now let's go to our tribunal lunch. Very good. We finish. Don't do this. You will have problems when you get to your examination if you do this. Now, okay. I'm getting to the end of my theory now, and then I have just a few little examples. This is, I am now going to some of the ideas which I and my colleagues find very useful in pushing forward methodology. Because I've given you lots of problems, now I give you some of the ideas we use. In the UK, in the last 30 years, there is a philosopher called Pascal who has established critical realism. I do not recommend that you read the books of Pascal because they are almost impossible to read. <laughs> I find them very hard in English. For you, I think it's not a good project to read this. So I suggest the secondary literature in this test. But the, the big picture here is Pascal is from a, a left-wing tradition. He is looking to try to assert, to say that social science has some, some reality, which is difficult if you believe in the empirical method. His model is that there are three domains. See, this is a course, not a lecture, okay? But there are three domains. The domain of the real, which is the domain of generative mechanisms. He says that physics works because in the universe there are generative mechanisms and structures which make it work. These things give rise to the actual, which is the events of the world. So he's saying there is a distinction between this light, which I see now, and the mechanism which generates my light. That also exists, he says. Hume would not agree. Hume would not agree. But he says the mechanism exists. And empirical study then is looking at the events. So I can study the light, I can test it, I can say intensity, whatever. So he distinguishes these three levels. The mechanisms 
can be social or they can be uh, physical. They can be in the domain of the physical sciences or the social sciences or ideas. This is difficult though, an idea. some parts of UK higher education. Um, so, informed by this theory, we take an unexplained phenomenon and propose a hypothetical explanation which would explain it if it existed. We don't know it, we haven't seen it, but we imagine it, and then we look to confirm or deny the explanation. It's not a traditional empirical, because the explanation does not emerge from the data. The explanation comes from our reflection on the problem. And the data is not the phenomenon to be explained. The data is an indication of something. The data is not the phenomenon. We are trying to go from the data to the event, to the mechanism, which is it. So our objective is different. We will have competing explanations for why things happen. So our job as researchers is to provide support or evidence against the explanation. This is kind of like Popper, but not the same. I like this because it is compatible with my cybernetic enthusiasm. I present it to you as an option. It's very useful if you want to have an empirical approach to the social sciences. Now, you will be pleased because you don't have to read Pascal um, immediately. The easy thing is to read this book if you are interested. Pawson and Tilly, Realistic Evaluation. Uh, this is as close as we have in our group to a required reading. Typically, this is what you, what you have. You have a context, which you decide. You propose a mechanism. And you look for regularities to, to, in the outcomes which would allow you to defend the mechanism. And the mechanism is your research outcome. If you can show that the mechanism, uh, defend the existence of a mechanism within a context, then that is what you're looking for. Now, I really do recommend this book. It's this long, it's not very big. And the first three pages made me laugh out loud. <laughs> this is not usual for a book about uh, evaluation method methodology. So it's not a uh, difficult book. But by what method do we observe outcomes? When trying to confirm or deny a method, you use whatever, out whatever methods you want. Now, statistics are very valuable in this to conform or rule, rule out mechanisms. This is not an anti-quantitative quantitative approach. But the statistics do not contain in themselves or give direct access to the thing which you are trying to explain. They are indications. Now, the, when using multiple in, the methodologies like statistics plus interviews, you have problems because they have different epistemologies, different understandings of the world. Um, and you have to think about this. Um, and I really recommend John Mingus, who is in information systems, but I think is relevant to all social sciences here. Um, 
in as an example of how to think about multiple methodologies. But the critical thing is, if you find your mechanism, you have a method for accumulating. Because when your research student number one identifies a mechanism, and research number two identifies a mechanism, and they're not quite the same, you can design a research program which will address this difference and try to posit another mechanism or to describe the difference in the context where, in which these mechanisms function. You can start to think. This is why I am an enthusiast. Now, okay, I've finished my presentation about theory now. And I know, if, if we've got time for a little, little discussion, okay, so these, I'm now just going to show you some of the things that worry me, which you might like to think about. Now this is a report from 2004. The development of the capital markets has provided significant benefits to the average citizen. Most importantly, it has led to more jobs and higher wages. The capital markets have also acted to reduce the volatility of the economy. Recessions are less frequent and milder when they occur. As a result, upward spikes in the unemployment rate have occurred less frequently and become less severe. 2004. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. There was a wonderful event in London four years ago when the Queen was opening a new centre of economics in the University of London. And she had a presentation about the economic disaster. The Queen is a very, very rich woman. <laughs> and she's thinking, millions, 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 millions. <laughs> and she said, why did nobody notice this happening? She said. And none of the economists could answer. They had no answer. Why did we not notice this coming? Now, this is, is a report by the Dean of Columbia Business School and an academic economist from Goldman Sachs. So these, these are the top people, and although we think these, these are economic, they would say we are working with scientific methodology to, to, to this result. <coughs> How is it possible that they can say this in 2004, and a year later, the world is turned upside down? There's a quote from Greenspan, who said, with notable exceptions, the economy has been stable. You know? Well, we have a notable exception today. So, so I kind of invite you to think, what's happening here? Does anyone, I mean, do you think about this in, in, when you are watching the television and reading the newspaper? Do you think about the methodology that, that leads to this? Because I suggest that you do. Um, does anybody have any thoughts on, on, on this? It doesn't matter if you don't. I have a, a more substantial example in a minute. Does anybody have any thoughts? But, um, this is, you know the, the expression, the elephant in the room. <laughs> okay, here is a very big elephant, a dinosaur in the room. And we carry on talking as if everything is comfortable. Now, this is, this is an example I'll talk about a little more. This is an epidemic in the United States. Okay? This is, these are children. This epidemic is affecting in the south here 11.8% of children. And clearly the epidemic is spreading from, there must be a center of the epidemic somewhere here, because in the northeast, 10.2 and midwest, it must be going forward and moving west as well. The, the, the epidemic has reached 7.8 in the western um, United States. So the question is, what is this epidemic? You can see it. A, it, is, it is described as an epidemic. What is it? Does anybody know what this epidemic is? You think it's been going on now from for a, from for at least six, seven years? This epidemic. Attention deficit. Yes. 
It's attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Well done. <laughs> okay, so isn't that interesting? Percentage of children, sorry? <laughs> sí. Pues yo estoy haciendo un poco de, de juego porque hay una epidemia, epidemia y yo estoy diciendo que sale de allí bajo el que está escribiendo usted de por los Estados Unidos. Esos son los niños que tienen este, que son, sufren, sufren de esta epidemia. La pregunta era: ¿cuál es la epidemia? Y tenemos una respuesta: es la epidemia. The attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. So, what is that? It's a infirmary mental district in the, the manual of diagnostic manual. And lleva al tratamiento de los enfermos con drogas. Pues, es eso. Now, um, th 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 this is an even bigger elephant for us than the, the, uh, the economic elephant. This is a really big elephant for us. What do we think about this? And so I'm going to ask you what you think about it in a minute. Visser et al, November 2013, this is a very recent paper, which you can get in free print, provide figures for 2011. Okay. Approximately 2 million more US 4 to 17 year olds diagnosed with ADHD in 2011 than 2003. 2 million more. Taking medication for ADHD, 69% of children with current ADHD. So of all the children who have ADHD, 69% are taking drugs for it. That is 6.1% of all children are medicated for ADHD. An increase of 28% from 2007 to 2011. Now, what do we think about this? I was looking about, looking, researching this last night, on the, looking at the web last night. We have two responses. Dr. John Walker, Director of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Wheel Cornell Medical College. So this is Cornell, big university. The data suggests the increasing diagnosis rate of ADHD is getting closer to the true prevalence of ADHD, which is even higher. So he is saying, it's good. We are in getting nearer to what must be the real problem. We've been working so hard for so long to improve treatment if the prevalence rate is 9 to 11 percent and we are getting 8 percent currently diagnosed, it suggests that public advocacy for treatment is paying off. So he's saying, these results show that in the United States, we are being effective in understanding this problem and treating it in a way which, for example, in Spain, we are not. So we should be following this example to try and find out if we have the same problem and if we can fix it. Dr. Alan Francis, former chair of psychiatry department at Duke University, another big American university. Psychiatry is a history of fads and we are now suffering from a fad of ADHD. A fad. A fad is um, una moda. More or less. Una moda que no tiene sentido. Mm? Como una fiebre. Como una fiebre. It suggests that it is not well, not logical. The rates have tripled over the past 15 years because of sales pressure from the pharmaceutical companies selling stimulants to treat ADHD. We are medicalizing immaturity and turning childhood into a disease. So you have two explanations. And how are you going to distinguish? You are going to distinguish because you have a coherent understanding of methodology and a position which you take on methodology which allows you to say, I don't agree with this, I agree with that. 
Mr. Raphael concludes that efforts to further understand ADHD diagnostic treatment patterns are warranted. Further research is necessary. Of course. How could we solve it? So what I'm saying here is if you think that methodology is a recipe, you will not be able to resolve this problem. So, oh, let's see, that's my last slide. So let's just briefly say, what do you think about this? You are education students or go to your, you're all working with education? Everybody is working with education in one way or another, more or less? So what do you think? Let's have a show of hands. So, how many agree with uh, Mr. John Walker? Anybody agree with Mr. John Walker? How many agree with Mr. Mr. Francis? <laughs> Anybody doesn't know? No, I don't know. How many don't know? Oh, that's very clear. Okay, so <laughs> you have a very clear position that ADHD is, um, I'm going to say what I think now, uh, is, uh, has been, is an idealized dormative principle. Remember I said that the dormative principle was saying we are looking at these children. We see that they don't want to concentrate in class. We say they have, don't want to concentrate in classness in them. We can measure it and we can produce it by medication. So we have a methodological problem. Um, what's the time? How are we doing? I mean, I, I'm basically I'm finished. I don't know if you want to talk more about this case. It seems that we, are, we agree on each other. Does, do my, does my presentation, are there any questions about what I have said which relate to this? Are you thinking? Yeah. yeah. I have a question. In, perhaps it's a silly question. How, in a fact as problematic as this, because you have children that maybe have really had ADHD, how can it be so different perspectives? I mean, uh, one uh, very, uh, uh, a very recognized expert says uh, we are increasing our. Uh, success uh, rate on diagnosing and treatment, and another person, uh, this doctor Francis, is saying uh, it, it's just um, a, a fact. Mm -hmm. How? How can that be? Yeah. It's scary, isn't yeah. it? It's scary. Um, well, th there are a, a number of different ways of answering your question. One is. The, the dormative principle I've just said. Another is the power of marketing and money and pharmaceutical industry. Another is our, our tendency to idealize behavior into things. So, yeah. But we can reach a, a conclusion using meta-analysis, for example. Well, um, 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 Yes, but not if, um, because this debate is about the nature of ADHDL, ADHL. It's not a, 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 a and so meta-analysis will give us very interesting information and useful uh, perspectives, but it will not resolve, I think, the question, does ADHDL, ADHL exist as a thing? Now, ADHD, my question is, if you cannot posit a mechanism, be very careful about the claims which you make for the thing which is ADHL. All we have is a syndrome. Syndrome is a collection of, of characteristics which we, for our research purposes, put in a bag. We could put them in different bags. So the deep, the deep answer to your question is, as um, human beings, we like 
to put things in bags. And we like to label them. We like to say British. And so, strange sense of humor, drinks tea. Yeah. We like to think black, different, has these characteristics. Women, different, have these characteristics. We place the character in them. If we do not have a mechanism, we should question our ascription of the characteristic to the, the person. That's a long answer. Does that, does that make any sense? So I'm, I'm, I'm truly, I'm not saying that the site, for example, that the, the, uh, the, the academic who defended RDHL, I'm not saying he is an evil man or badly intentioned. And perhaps he's doing the right thing. I don't know. But, but I have problems. But in the United States, is uh, medication uh, the first answer, usually? It's the majority answer. I think they medicate 70% of the as, people. As a first answer to the... Well, they, I'm sure that they have, in the, in the manual, there will be a, a procedure where you decide if it's a case for medication or not. And the drug companies will say what suit what for what cases it is suitable. Are there any more questions for would you like to go for lunch? <laughs> I'm very happy to stay here. Or we can talk um, informally. Uh, it's very interesting the part about the methodology, but uh, I don't push sure. Uh, the uh, the use of the of the medical therapy and the ADHD no mm -hmm. is the same use about the I, IQ test and the other type of diagnostic for recognize the the difficulty of of uh, of staying with other of of um, have a real problem in this uh, in this type of ADHD mm -hmm. the problem of, of the education or uh, in the in the different context is really. But uh, in Italy, for example, uh, uh, we we search to to resolve to 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 give an answer to the child who who have this type of problem without use the yeah. therapy, med a medical therapy, yeah. because this is it. Yes, uh, this is the solution in United States. Um, no, uh, it's the most simple to use the medical therapy yeah. uh, in. Um, and no, in the same yeah. time. Yes. Yes. No, so the, 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 your, that, that's interesting. And there are two questions here, uh, not yours, but mine. Two questions. One is, uh, is it a better idea to be cautious about medication because medication medicating is a big intervention in the life of a child? So. Let's be careful. Okay, we think it's ADHL, but in Italy we have the policy to not medicate. This is Another problem for educationalists is, uh, and I know this is true in Spain, I know it's true in the UK, it is to the interest of the school to classify their children as having ADHL, as having learning difficulties, as having, because they get money for it, which is good. We want the schools to have resources to help. But inevitably, there is a cycle which reinforces the, uh, the description of these children as having attention deficit or learning difficulties or whatever it is, emotional, psychological, because the structure of the, the, the for the teachers, for the head teachers, for the parents, everybody has a motive for uh, using this description. The, the children themselves, they know now why they are bottom of the class. It's, it's because I have this thing it's that I'm bottom of the class. So we should all. It's not only the uh, the drug companies. Who, want, who, who push this. This is deep in our thinking about ourselves and our way of understanding the world. Do you think I'm right about that? Am I, uh, am I pushing too far now? Am I, am I taking you with me? Or are you thinking, nah, 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 nah. 
I don't see any any anybody standing up to to shout at me. No. <laughs> any any more questions? Is, does that does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay, I think, think Frank, they've been very patient. Habéis estado muy pacientes. Muchas gracias a todos, especialmente los que no hablan tan bien inglés.